we are going to be a smart platform. I mean, we're going to have more compute on, on each of our satellites than what's been up there ever before. It facilitates refueling. It facilitates satellite repair because that's going to be a fairly complicated process. Anything where you require some degree of autonomy on, on, the, on the part of your satellite, right. that's going to require compute. And as we move farther away from LEO, as we move to cislunar space and we have Artemis coming on, that's going to require a significant amount of compute too, because the farther away you get from mm. Earth, the bigger a deal latency becomes. And mm. just having a teleoperated radio control robot is not going to cut it. Welcome back to the Cold Star Project, the podcast about the unexpected challenges of scaling companies, including space firms. I am here with Richard Ward. He likes to be called Rick, and he is the founder and chief technical officer of a company called Orbit's Edge. He's a past Marine. Uh, I was interested in seeing that he was DSI's production manager and P, uh, chief lab researcher. And uh, like In Orlando. Me, yeah. Oh, okay. He comes at it sideways. He, he didn't have the degrees and stuff like that. It's, uh, I was like, damn, I'm real curious about how he got that role. Maybe we'll talk about that later. We've had a good chat here for uh, uh, quite a while before we started recording. Uh, thanks for being here, Rick. Uh, it's a pleasure, Jason. It's uh, I've been checking out your podcast for the past uh, few weeks, uh, about a month, and I've really enjoyed your content. Cool, cool. Why don't we begin with talking about what Orbit's Edge is? Because it's a, it's a company, it's a relatively new company, I believe, but it is getting recognition by NASA and other space organizations. Yeah, so we're pushing on a year old, and our company is built around a technology we call the SAT frame which its purpose is to provide an environment that allows commercial off-the-shelf data center grade computers to operate in space, uh, taking into account the radiation, the thermal, and the power management systems that are needed to do that. So we're, we're providing that home, and to go with that, our first move is a partnering with HPE, so that we can put one of their uh, micro data centers in, in the SAT frame and that in space and provide edge computing in orbit. Okay, now I got to ask the big question, what the heck is edge computing and how does that apply to this situation? Okay, so edge computing, uh, there's a ginormous definition on Wikipedia, but the long and short of it is doing your processing as close to the point of data origination or collation as possible. So wherever the data is, that's where you crunch it the first time. Mm. Okay. So if you're, if you're operating in a mine, it doesn't make sense to have a fat pipe to move everything to the nearest city so that you can do the processing. Mm. It makes a lot more sense to have at least some degree of processing capability right there where you are so that you can at least take care of the vast majority of it before you send whatever you, whatever you need to archive on down the line. And that's really, that's a technology that's come out about, it's, it's around 30 years old at this point. Mm. Uh, the concept and, and the, the effect of, data, of edge processing, and we are working on putting it in space. So it's new and it's also not new. Okay, but currently, no edge computing capability in space right now. There is none. There's actually, um, when I first got into the space industry, I was kind of surprised to find out what kind of compute exists in space today. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the popular processors today is one called the RAD 750. It's uh, based on the PowerPC 750. And that is from the 90s. Uh, the RAD 750 came out in like 01 or 02, and it's running a 200 megahertz processor, and that is what's going to be on the Mars 2020 rover. So it's not like that was being used 10 or 15 years ago. It's being used today. Now, it has a very special use case where it has to operate with very low power consumption for 20 years. I mean, it had those things are designed to live forever. Right, I mean, right. some of those things are going to be around 100 years from now they are limited in what they can actually offer. So if we can do something that has orders of magnitude more performance in compute, but has like a, say a three year life cycle, then we can, we can get ahead. We can move, we can move the ball forward on that. 
Okay. Well, it sounds like we're at least a little bit ahead of MSCADA and PLCs uh, <laughs> with this stuff. So what has yeah. what what that meant that you've needed to develop as technology so that Orbit's Edge can fulfill this mission? Okay. So we've had to develop some uh, very interesting IPs in order to make this work. Uh, since you're putting so much power, okay, since you're doing so much compute, go at it from the, from the end result, all that compute means you need a lot of power. All that power means lots of solar panels. Mm -hmm. It also means lots of batteries because you've got, you're only in daytime half the time. And since you're in the dark half the time, that means even more solar panels mm -hmm. to power the batteries. Power management has already been done. That's not a brand new thing that we're tackling. Uh, but the other side of it is that much power into a computer means that much power is going to be converted into heat. Hmm. So we've had to develop an entire uh, thermal management system that will allow us to main, keep the computers in their optimal operating temperature environments. Uh, in addition to that, we've had to develop a, so a software stack that goes on top of the compute that comes into us, uh, on top of our computers, that will help to keep the temperature range uh, within optimal characteristics and also detect and deal with radiation events. Because what we're doing is we're developing technology that will mitigate, it's, it's, it's mitigative shielding, I guess. It's uh, shielding that takes that absorbs some of the radiation but it can't absorb all of it because that gets prohibitive there's types of radiation um iron ions are incredibly energetic and stopping them is is not feasible uh with with mass constraints that we have so we've developed software overlays that will detect and protect the mechanism from damage so that's that's one that those are basically the things that we've had to develop and all that is is IP stuff that we are uh, we're pursuing IP protection strategies that some of it involves patents and some of it involves uh, just squirreling it away. Um, but yeah, we're that that's that's the stuff that we're working on developing right now. Okay, very very interesting, and that the protection stuff is is of interest to me too. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a little chat about that after. <laughs> so I love that. so your, your past experience includes uh, metalworking. I, I ran a metal fab shop for a couple of years back in Vancouver. Uh, you were doing some custom stuff and that. And then also lab research at DSI, which, um, again, I'm super curious how you landed that role. Uh, and a lot of this feels like physical, working with your hands kind of thing, hands-on anyway, at least, right? And so why a computing-focused business rather than a physically-focused one? Okay, I um, feel like there's a couple or three different questions in there. So how did I end up in DSI? Uh, I, met, I met Stephen Covey, who was one of the original founders of, of DSI, at a uh, asteroid talk at a convention. And I talked to him. At the time, I had I'd been writing a uh, science fiction novel that featured asteroid mining. And because I'm a bit obsessive on getting things right. I had done lots of research <laughs> in a topic that was very hard to do research in. Uh. <laughs> and I was able to talk to him and he thought that I wasn't uh, too terribly off on my stuff. So he told me that he, that they were looking at opening up a new branch in Orlando and I maintained contact with him. Uh, that happened and I ended up working there for two years and we did work with asteroid regolith simulant, mm -hmm. which, uh, so there's a, not a lot of asteroids that you can chew up, grind up and crush and burn because they're mm -hmm. kind of expensive, or at least the non-metal ones are, the non-nickel irons are. So we were making high fidelity simulant and we had to go through various recipes and uh, concoctions and figure out how mm -hmm. to combine terrestrial materials, minerals, to get stuff that acted and behaved and was as close to the real stuff as possible for research purposes. Mm -hmm. And I was involved in that and uh, also involved in some research on that. Uh, I ended up, 
I ended up having to weld a bunch of stuff. I had to do a lot of metal fabrication to, to alter or fix or build uh, pieces of equipment that we needed. So yeah, it was, uh, it kind of, it's weird. Everything I've ever done has somehow ended up drawing on my past experiences. So it might not touch everything, but uh, something that I've done in the past has always come back to be useful in the present. Hmm. Yeah, I, I feel a similar way about that. Okay. Um, I feel like I only answered one of those. Yeah, yeah. So why a computing-based business then? So you had the physical background, and then now this, this thing which looks not out of character, but a little different. Um, so that probably, as part of my novel, I had looked at some sort of generic compute modules that could grow and scale and be backwards compatible to a reasonable degree and advance into the future because that's how I imagined things should be. Then I get into the real space industry and find out that is not the way things are. <laughs> and I kind of shelved it mentally for a bit, but I didn't really shelve it. I, I kind of said, if this is the way they should be and this is the way they are, then I still kind of wanted to do that. And I ended up in a conversation with another guy who's uh, he's been in it for 30 years and he was saying, uh, I'm kind of interested in doing, seeing how you could do compute in space, like high power compute in space. And I said, well, I've had this idea for this generic box that this box that you can put generic stuff in generic compute stuff in, and that would be a mechanism for that. And he said, yeah, that sounds, that sounds kind of cool. And then we started talking about power requirements and that mm -hmm. turned into heat requirements. And then that turned into radiation requirements. And there you have the sat frame, like the core of the idea came together in two or three weeks. And that's, that's not like eight hour day weeks, but it's mm -hmm. like two or three weeks worth of, worth of initial conversations and, and, you know, sketching stuff out. So that's that's kind of kind of where that came and also um in the aftermath of dsi i always had this love for space mining mm -hmm. uh i read i read uh the case for mars yeah um i checked that out from the library when it was that's new. robert zubrin's book right yes yeah. robert zubrin's case for mars now i have a an autographed a copy, signed copy. <laughs> that i picked yeah. up picked up of the case for space uh, I got that at the New Worlds. It's autographed somewhere. Hmm. Um, I got it at the New Worlds. Bob knows. <laughs> yeah. At, at uh, what is it called? Uh, it's New New Worlds Conference in Austin. Hmm. I got that last last year. It was like the second or third time I've met Dr. Hmm. Zubrin. So that was kind of cool. It's uh, one of those things where things have changed a lot. Hmm. You know. <laughs> Like I read his book and I thought it was just amazing and, um, you know, read it multiple times to, to catch everything. And that kind of fed my idea that, you know, we should, we should do these things. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, you know, having conversations with this guy and it's just a, just a few years later. Um, it kind of, it kind of, it kind of puts me off sometimes hmm. like there's times that I, I catch myself. I'm in this conversation mm -hmm. with this person who is incredibly intelligent, mm -hmm. incredibly gifted, just a, a Titan of the industry. And I'm like, this guy is talking to me. Right. And yeah. he's, he's yeah. agreeing with something I just said. And that <laughs> just, it blows me away. And I don't really see where I could find another industry Hmm. where I could replicate that experience. Hmm. Like I'm not going to be able to talk to Peter somebody Tucker huge or, in yeah. any other industry. Yeah, exactly. I can't just uh, walk up to Bill Gates and have a conversation right. about computers with him. Right. So that, that stuff just, that stuff, that stuff is powerful. It's, mm -hmm. it's an, it's an intense motivator to keep you on the track. You feel like you're getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I love it. I love it. So yeah, that. 
<laughs> so Rick is saying, everyone, hey, wait, no, I have made a physical thing. The sat frame is a physical thing with all oh. these requirements, right? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, so the, the sat frame is yeah. is actually a physical thing. There's there's plenty of work to be uh, done on on thermal regulation, on on uh, power management, and there's a lot of systems to be built. So I do get to get my hands dirty and I have the opportunity to cut and burn myself, which is what I really love. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So you've got this idea. Uh, people are taking notice. You're getting to meet people. Um, it's confidence is, is pouring into the idea. You're creating prototypes and that. What mm -hmm. barriers to user adoption do you foresee? I run this little show called Make Space Boring, which is a quick mm -hmm. thing about uh, who I'm meeting and what I'm learning a couple times a week in addition to this full format thing. Uh, user adoption is the name of the game, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Are they nuts not to do this, to use this? I think they'll get left behind if they don't do this. We've had. Um, our first public event was probably the New Worlds Conference in Austin. That was in November. And at that point, a lot of the NASA folks, a lot of the space folks were not really immediately grasping the utility of edge compute in space. Like, what can you do with powerful processors in space? Who is your customer? What is your use case? And, you know, we had to lay that out for them. And, and this was, you know, six months in. So our cases were not as sophisticated and as well laid out as they are today. Uh, I'd like to say that that's, that repeats itself in six months as well. Because uh, you always want to be growing. You always want to be learning. You always want to be coming up with new stuff. So we had to really explain to them the utility, utility of it. And then recently, like a month ago, we went to... Um, a NASA event in Tampa and we talked about that and the response had really advanced. Uh, people were, you know, regular NASA folks were saying, oh yeah, this is essential. Uh, we need, we need this piece of infrastructure. This is something mm -hmm. that we're lacking. It had gone from what is the benefit to this to yes, please. Right. And that's really I think everybody in the space industry has had to undergo some sort of an internal paradigm shift over the past six months, maybe. Hmm. Uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot more a lot more optimism for the future. I'm seeing a lot more willingness to entertain big plans than I was a year ago. Uh, there was stuff that you could have said a year ago that would have not gone over well and today uh very serious people are talking about it and they're they're writing papers on it and they're seeking funding on it and funding is getting released for for things that were buck rogers just a little bit ago hmm. interesting culture shifts and and optimism and that and uh Huh. It, it's being able to say stuff that would be laughed at or, or dismissed a short time ago is, is yep. really weird. Yeah, it's, it's like a strange thing. So let, let's talk about those customers and what they're going to get out of having uh, Orbit's Edge technology up, up there. Uh, beyond data transfer and speed to insight, we have a data science department, so that stuff's important to me. What other savings or advantages will customers experience? So... Part of it is what we can do in terms of analytics of space data. A lot of that is going to be earth imaging and that moves into multispectral and uh, multiple images over time. Those are some of the greatest amounts of data that are generated in space. So those, uh, in those cases, we can better utilize the observational assets to, to have basically better quality data down. We can perform analytics to, to not only assess quality of the images and throw out bad ones, but also find out uh, patterns that are of interest to the user. Uh, there's a very simple version, a very simple description of a process that we could do. Uh, as you go over the ocean, most of the ocean is ocean. 
and a very small fraction of that is ships and whales and uh, oil slicks and mm -hmm. things that are of things that are not ocean. Right. You could have a relatively simple AI that sorts those things out mm. and sends down everything that's not ocean. Uh, mm. And along with perhaps uh, metadata about the ocean that it does pass over. Right. So in that case, you would have a, you would have a lot of data that is of use of mm. potential use, and you would not have the data that is essentially lots of noise. And you would even right. get some data about that data which would be uh, very useful. Hmm. Now, in addition to that, we can do things like run AIs and we can do machine hmm. learning. Uh, we are gonna be a smart platform. I mean, we're hmm. gonna have more compute on, on each of our satellites than, than what's been up there ever before. And we can utilize that capability to improve the efficiency of our own operation as well as for other people. And this allows things like uh, it facilitates refueling, it facilitates um, satellite repair, because that's going to be a fairly complicated process. Anything where you require some degree of autonomy on, on, the, on the part of your satellite, right. that's going to require compute. And as we move farther away from LEO, as we move to cislunar space and we, we, have, we have Artemis coming on, mm -hmm. that's, that's going to require a significant amount of compute too, because the farther away you get from mm -hmm. Earth, the bigger a deal latency becomes. And mm -hmm. just having a teleoperated radio control robot is not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is something that people are quick to forget. Um, by the time we yeah. get colonies on Mars, it's going to be back to the age of telegraph again. It is. Uh, it is. It's going to be. It's yeah. going to be carrier pigeon. I mean, I can send a video to you, and then later in the day, I'll maybe have one back. Right. Right. It ain't going to be this way, <laughs> yeah. folks. You can't afford to be second best. You need to be first, and that requires speed. Now, if you're thinking that growth is supposed to be slow and steady, frankly, the way I was taught back in the '90s in the operations management and business administration programs. You are too slow. We have to adapt. And in space, it's no different than anywhere else. People like to think they're special in space, and it is fun, all the stuff we get to work on, but business is business. The fundamentals nowadays are conservative growth is not good. You need to run as fast as you can and risk outstripping your supply lines, which means in our world, using up the capital that we've got. That's a risk but there is no prize for second place. There certainly is no prize for third. If you want to scale operationally fast, come talk to us at Cold Star Tech. We are the process experts for scaling fast. Now back to the interview. You mentioned the word infrastructure. I just want to pop out and say this a, a little bit ago. Um, that stood out to me. The, the um, YouTube video version of this show uh, has there's not only the giant list of 100 and blah 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 episodes there are smaller playlists of uh, focused episodes so there's one for infrastructure there's one for space space and small sets there's one for sales and marketing for example and so you you don't have to sort through a hundred episodes to get what you want you could go to uh, the cold star tech YouTube channel and look for a playlist so that may help some listeners out in finding areas of focus for them. Um, let's see, I was business development manager long ago and far away for an IT firm. And uh, a lot of what we did was custom coding of bridges between two different softwares, like an inventory management software and an accounting software, because customers would come to us and say, damn, oh, what got shipped wasn't what got billed. And now we have upset customers. <laughs> that, right? yes. and build something in the middle so that these things can talk to each other. And I noticed that you are on the website and, and your LinkedIn profile on that four orbits ad you're talking about buying a lot of off-the-shelf components and getting them to work together have there been any surprises in what resources you needed to get together either in uh, oh wow we need this I didn't even know that or just difficulty of sourcing um, I guess the biggest surprise that wasn't a surprise is the cost of components from some of the uh, the, the pioneers in the space industry. If you buy stuff from one of the big companies that has, has been manufacturing uh, satellite components, 
you're going to pay quite dearly for it. And I mean, I knew it because everybody generally ends up doing vertical integration. And that's mostly because they just can't find the stuff they need at the price that they're able to pay mm -hmm. for it. But to know it and then to see the numbers <laughs> was, <laughs> was yeah. a bit of a surprise. Okay. And this obviously so, affects the pricing to, to customers down the road. Of course it does. Yeah. Yes. And that's, that's, um, when you're doing fundraising and you have to do a raise to get mm -hmm. off the ground, literally, if you say, and we only need a hundred million dollars to get off, to get one satellite off the ground, then that is the end of your, <laughs> that is the right. end of your business model. Your, your yeah. science experiment just died. Huh. But if you can, uh, intelligently source things that are going to work and are, you know, serious value adds, uh, buy what you have to build what you can and have an eye towards improving or increasing verticality farther down the line. Mm -hmm. Um, then you can get those numbers down to where they're manageable, where an investor can, can not have to pick his jaw off the floor when you tell right. him what, what you're needing. And they feel that this amount is a reasonable amount in exchange mm -hmm. for what is offered. This right. is not impossible. Right. So yeah, yeah, I imagine there's a, a return of uh, eat the first two, three satellites are incredibly expensive uh, to get up there. And then after that, there's a reduction. Uh, I would imagine there's, there's a certain amount to that. There's also the fact that while we will not achieve uh, global coverage, obviously, with two or three satellites, mm -hmm. we will have some degree of usability. Right. And each so, time you you launch, you're incurring that launch cost again, and the risk of getting them all blown up in, <laughs> in a launch failure. Uh, how many, how many satellites are you? <laughs> I believe you did an episode on insurance recently. Yep. Yeah, yeah, with Bob Weirdy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so how many satellites are you thinking about here, at least for the first batch of them up there and, and getting something that works? So we're actually wanting to do two prototypes, mm -hmm. uh, because in order to put one in space, you have to build two. Mm -hmm. And in order to put two in space, you need to build three. Yeah. And the difference between two and three is not as significant mm -hmm. as zero and one. So that's, that's kind of our goal. Also, that would allow us to do uh, more communications between the satellites and test out our model that much better. Uh, it'll be that much more, well, redundancy is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. So once we get into our constellation model, that is about 24 birds to achieve uh, total global connectivity. And from there, it's a matter of scaling out to improve uh, as we go, as we get better saturation. Uh, I know, I know some of this sounds like, you know, Wi-Fi for everybody, but it's not. It's, it's a matter of being able to interface with satellites that are in the air and ground stations that are sending up um, so that we can have coverage on that. Mm -hmm. From there, it's a matter of uh, expanding to meet customer needs, customer requirements. So that's, that's the thing where we are expecting to have to expand fairly rapidly as, as our, um, as our processing capabilities get saturated. Right. Right. Well, the interesting thing here that, that's striking me is this can't be a half done thing. It's, uh, you, you do it all or you don't start, I think. Uh, uh not, investor. not quite so much. It's, hmm. It's one of those where when we get our first couple of satellites, um, of, of production model satellites, mm -hmm. we will actually be able to get utilization. We'll be able to do, uh, we'll be able to serv service customers at the one and two level of satellites. We'll, we'll be somewhat limited in uh, how often and what we can do. But as we fill out towards a fully populated constellation, we'll we'll be able to get better connectivity and we'll be able to uh provide the results more quickly than than we will initially but at least we will be doing something that can mm -hmm. bring in paychecks okay. fairly early on <laughs> that sounds good are these going into low earth orbit or mid or where they're going low they're they're going into high low earth orbit we're looking mm -hmm. at about 600 kilometers right now okay. 
uh, initially. As we populate that shell, uh, we intend to bring it down a little bit. That'll improve our latency. But as you move into lower and lower orbits, um, you need more and more of them. You need more and more, and that yeah. scales rapidly. Uh, that scales scarily fast. So yeah. if you want to be at the 200 kilometer range, you're going to have a mega constellation. Right. So I'm not saying that we're that we are or aren't going to go to get mm -hmm. there, but that is that is one hmm. of our uh, considerations. What's the, what's the disadvantage of of coming lower to the Earth then, a and advantage I guess maybe if any. Uh, disadvantage. One of the disadvantages is you don't stay there as long. You tend to fall mm -hmm. down. Uh, you, yeah. you have more atmospheric drag. Right. You have somewhat lower radiation. Uh, as long as you stay below like 700, 800 kilometers, mm -hmm. you're, you're fairly okay on radiation, but the radiation is somewhat lesser at the lower, lower level. Uh, we already mentioned that you need a heck of a lot more birds to achieve mm -hmm. uh, total connectivity because right. uh, your shadow over the earth is much smaller for each individual bird. Right. Um, you're, and you, you pass the ground stations much, much more infrequently if that's, if that's a concern for you, because we do have to get the data back down once yep. it's, once something's done with it. Um, the pros are you improve your latency. You you reduce yeah. latency at lower at a lower orbit. So that's that's uh, that's the biggest reason hmm. that the Starlink constellation is going to be so low. So they can hmm. they can really work on that latency issue. Hmm. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much pretty much the big thing. Hmm. The big things. All right. So let's jump forward, I don't know, five, six, maybe 10 years. Uh, what do you think that you're going to see in the commercialization of space and, and your company Orbit's Edge's effect upon it? Okay. So uh, five, six, 10 years. I would like to see that the Artemis program is moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, that is the most ambitious thing that NASA has attempted in a very long time. Mm -hmm. It is, it's, it's kind of fulfilling that promise and it's kind of putting us on the path to a full blown space bearing civilization. Mm -hmm. And as many of the terrestrial benefits we've seen to technology based on the original moon push, I mean, that's, it's a lot more than Tang. That's a lot of material science, a lot of metallurgy, the age of the microcomputer, all of these things are offshoots from, from 1960s NASA tech. And as NASA and lots of commercial companies work to develop technology that will support Artemis, I'm expecting to see that same thing happen again. And when we have people uh, living and working and eating on the moon, we're going to develop technologies that will make life better for all the people who are here on earth watching those things happen. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be great for everyone. And we would like to play a part in that because I mentioned earlier, as you get simple machines can be teleoperated, but complicated machines really can't. You, you really need some degree of autonomy. You need it to be able to at least carry out some sort of task on its own. Um, if you're going to be, if you're going to have the lag time that you have going from the earth to the moon. And if you want to go farther than that, you, you need it even more so. Um, you can have a teleoperated rover on Mars because it moves meters per day. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a rover that is doing exploration or mining or something along those lines or production, uh, you're going to have to be moving tens of meters per hour mm -hmm. and self-driving cars on earth, they're generating about three to 40 gigabits per second that mm -hmm. they're in operation. That depends on what kind of, what kind of sensors they're using, mm -hmm. but all that requires significant amounts of processing that's on board. We've also got plans for uh, s separating our sat frame from the sat huh. 
and making it as a bolt-on module for mm. for rovers or for other satellites, as well as the uh, capability to put things in addition to computers in the sat frame so that we can run micro laboratories and things of that nature. So all of these operations are gonna require a significant amount of compute and we wanna be there to provide the infrastructure to enable those operations. Mm -hmm. That's exciting and I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, as soon as this infrastructure is available, I believe it's gonna open up the imagination of a lot of these planners and they're gonna go, wow, we couldn't do this mission before but now we have the capability to do it because we can move the data around and get insights it, on it. Now I can think of this kind of idea. So I think it's going it to really change, is. If you if you want to look at if you want to look at a, an infrastructure, what what can you do with clean fresh water? Mm -hmm. And that's the real question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot you can do with that. There's there's enormous things that you. It's, it's not just cooking and washing your clothes and swimming and eating and drinking. It's all the things that you can do with that. And that's basically where we are with, with what we're offering with edge computing in space and high power processing. What can you do with edge computing on earth? There are hundreds of different use cases where edge computing is, is in operation every single day and you don't realize it. Right. Makes, makes a lot of sense to me. So, Rick, where can people connect with you, find out more about Orbit's Edge, get involved? Well, we have uh, orbitsedge.com. We have our Twitter and our LinkedIn with same names. Uh, we, we tweet fairly regular. We're on, on LinkedIn pretty regular. And there's also my LinkedIn. You can talk to me there. Um, Remember to I look for Richard somewhat, Ward. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Richard J. Ward yes. on LinkedIn. I tweet somewhat less frequently. Uh, I believe uh, we also have a YouTube channel. Um, I believe the logo is this little guy, hmm. or at least a version of this little guy. This is a model of our sat frame. Lego dude, not to scale. <laughs> it's actually more of uh, the, this and this would be the same size roughly. So this shows our solar panel. It shows that hmm. we've got lots of solar capability. Uh, this is our radiator panel and here's where our compute module goes. This is an engine. Uh, it'd mm. probably actually be on the other end, but I need, I, I needed a mounting point and it has communications. Huh. So it folds up. <laughs> Lego is amazing. So it kind of uh, <laughs> deploys and, and undeploys. Huh. So these, these little guys fold up as well. So it's not glued together, Very but yeah, cool. that's, uh, that's our little mascot. <laughs> I will in the audio only version of this, I'll try and remember to put in a link or two to a couple of still pictures of that. And if I forget, <laughs> okay. somebody tell me, okay, just message me at Jason at coldstartech.com and say, Hey, you forgot to put the pictures in there and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rick. Well, I appreciate you being here today. My guest has been Richard Ward from Orbit's Edge. Uh, pretty neat new idea. I look forward to seeing what you do. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking with you today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to talking to you again as we're a bit farther down the line. And maybe, uh, maybe the thing I can show you is a little bit, a little bit different than this. Right on. Hey, this is Jason Kanigan, the host of the Cold Star Project and the founder of Cold Star Technologies. I've decided to do something new. I've started doing daily update videos on who I met and what I learned the previous day in the space field. And it's a great sort of follow me thing. You can learn what I learn. I'm meeting a heck of a lot of people and learning a lot of things really fast. And the space field is really disparate. There are tons of nooks and crannies to go into and explore from legal, operational, you know, regulatory, compliance and gosh the end customer who would have thought about that right so you can sign up for this if you go to coldstartech.com slash msb that's short for make space boring the mission we're on then you can sign up and in your email you will get a daily notification that the new video has been posted i'm also thinking about doing some branded mini courses and summarizing papers as uh, i'm able to so those will be some goodies that are in there as well so if you're interested in that go to coldstartech.com msb and join us on the mission to make space boring <laughs> <laughs>